The Notorious Jumping Frog of Calaveras County by Mark Twain In compliance with the request of a friend of mine who wrote me from the East, I called on good-natured garrulous old Simon Wheeler, and inquired after my friend's friend, Leonidas W. Smiley, as requested to do, and I hereunto append the result. I have a lurking suspicion that Leonidas W. Smiley is a myth, that my friend never knew such a personage, and that he only conjectured that, if I asked old Wheeler about him, it would remind him of his infamous Jim Smiley, and he would go to work and bore me nearly to death with some infernal reminiscence of him, as long and tedious as it should be useless to me. If that was the design, it certainly succeeded. I found Simon Wheeler dozing comfortably by the barroom stove of the old dilapidated tavern in the ancient mining camp of Angels, and I noticed that he was fat and bald-headed, and had an expression of winning gentleness and simplicity upon his tranquil countenance. He roused up, and gave me good day. I told him a friend of mine had commissioned me to make some inquiries about a cherished companion of his boyhood, named Leonidas W. Smiley, Reverend Leonidas W. Smiley, a young minister of the gospel, who he had heard was at one time a resident of Angel's Camp. I added that, if Mr. Wheeler could tell me anything about this Reverend Leonidas W. Smiley, I would feel under many obligations to him. Simon Wheeler backed me into a corner and blockaded me there with his chair, and then sat me down and reeled off the monotonous narrative which follows this paragraph. He never smiled, he never frowned, he never changed his voice from the gentle flowing key to which he tuned the initial sentence. He never betrayed the slightest suspicion of enthusiasm. But all through the interminable narrative there ran a vein of impressive earnestness and sincerity, which showed me plainly that, so far from his imagining that there was anything ridiculous or funny about his story, he regarded it as a really important matter and admired its two heroes as men of transcendent genius in finesse. To me, the spectacle of a man drifting serenely along through such a queer yarn without ever smiling was exquisitely absurd. As I said before, I asked him to tell me what he knew of Reverend Leonidas W. Smiley, and he replied as follows. I let him go on in his own way, and never interrupted him once. There was a fellow here once by the name of Jim Smiley in the winter of forty-nine, or maybe it was the spring of fifty, I don't recollect exactly, somehow. Though what makes me think it was one or the other is because I remember the big flume wasn't finished when he first came to the camp. But anyway, he was the curiousest man about always betting on anything that turned up you ever see, if he could get anybody to bet on the other side. And if he couldn't, he'd change sides. Any way that suited the other man would suit him. Any way just so as he got a bet, he was satisfied. But still he was lucky, uncommon lucky. He must always come out winner. He was always ready and laying for a chance. There couldn't be no solitary thing mentioned, but that fellow had offered a bet on it, and take any side you please, as I was just telling you. If there was a horse race, you'd find him flush, or you'd find him busted at the end of it. If there was a dog fight, he'd bet on it. If there was a cat fight, he'd bet on it. If there was a chicken fight, he'd bet on it. Why, if there was two birds setting on a fence, he would bet you which one would fly first or if there was a camp meeting, he would be there regular, to bet on Parson Walker, which he judged to be the best exhorter about here, and so he was, too, and a good man. If he ever seen a straddle-bug start to go anywhere, as he would bet you how long it would take him to get wherever he was going to, and if you took him up, he would follow that straddle-bug to Mexico, but what he would find out where he was bound for, and how long he was on the road. 
Lots of the boys here has seen that Smiley and can tell you about him. Why, it never made no difference to him. He would bet on anything, the dangdest fella. Parson Walker's wife laid very sick once for a good while, and it seems as if they weren't going to save her. But one morning he come in, and Smiley asked how she was, and he said she was considerable better, thank the Lord for his infinite mercy, and coming on so smart that with the blessing of Providence she'd get well yet. And Smiley, before he thought, says, Well, I'll risk two and a half that she don't anyway. This here Smiley had a mare. The boys called her the fifteen-minute nag, but that was only in fun, you know, because, of course, she was faster than that, and he used to win money on that horse, for all she was so slow and always had the asthma, or the distemper, or the consumption, or something of that kind. They used to give her two or three hundred yards start, and then pass her under way, but always at the fag end of the race she'd get excited and desperate, like and come cavorting and straddling up and scattering her legs around limber, sometimes in the air, and sometimes out to one side amongst the fences, and kicking up more dust, and raising more racket with her coughing and sneezing and blowing her nose, and always fetch up at the stand just about a neck ahead, as near as you could cipher it down. And he had a little small bull pup, that to look at him you'd think he wasn't worth a cent, but to set around and look ornery, and lay for a chance to steal something. But as soon as money was up on him he was a different dog. His underjawed began to stick out like the forecastle of a steamboat, and his teeth would uncover and shine savage like the furnaces. And a dog might tackle him, and bully-rag him, and bite him, and throw him over his shoulder two or three times. And Andrew Jackson, which was the name of the pup, Andrew Jackson would never let on but what he was satisfied, and hadn't expected nothing else, and the bets being doubled and doubled on the other side all the time, till the money was all up, and then all of a sudden he would grab that other dog just by the joint of his hind leg and freeze to it. Not chew, you understand, but only just grip and hang on till they throwed up the sponge if it was a year. Smiley always come out winner on that pup, till he harnessed a dog once that didn't have no hind legs, cos they'd been sawed off by a circular saw, and when the thing had gone along far enough and the money was all up, and he'd come to make a snatch for his pet holt, he saw in a minute how he'd been imposed on and how the other dog had him in the door, so to speak, and he peered surprised, and then he looked sort of discouraged, like, and didn't try no more to win the fight, and so he got shucked out bad. He gives Smiley a look, as much as to say his heart was broke, and it was his fault for putting up a dog that hadn't no hind legs for him to take hold of, which was his main dependence in a fight and then he limped off a piece and laid down and died. It was a good pup, was that Andrew Jackson, and would have made a name for himself if he'd lived, for the stuff was in him, and he had genius. I know it, because he hadn't had no opportunities to speak of, and it don't stand to reason that a dog could make such a fight as he could under them circumstances if he hadn't no talent. It always makes me feel sorry when I think of that last fight of his and, and the way it turned out. Well, this year Smiley had rat tarriers and chicken cocks and tom cats and all them kind of things till you couldn't rest and you couldn't fetch nothing for him to bet on but he'd match you. He catched a frog one day and took him home and said he calculated to educate him and so he never done nothing for three months, but set in his back yard, and learn that frog to jump. And you bet he did learn him too. He'd give him a little punch behind, and the next minute you'd see that frog whirling in the air like a doughnut. See him turn one somerset, or maybe a couple, if he got a good start, 
and come down flat-footed and all right, like a cat. He got him up so in the matter of catching flies, and kept him in practice so constant that he'd nail a fly every time as far as he could see him. Smiley said all a frog wanted was education, and he could do most anything, and I believe him. I have seen him set Dan'l Webster down here on this floor. Dan'l Webster was the name of the frog and sing out, flies, Daniel, flies, and quicker than you could wink, he'd spring straight up and snake a fly off on the counter there, and flop down on the floor again as solid as a gob of mud, and fall to scratching the side of his head with his hind foot, as indifferent as if he hadn't no idea he'd been doing any more than any frog might do. You never see a frog so modest and straightforward as he was. For all he was so gifted. And when he come to fair and square jumping on a dead level, he could get over more ground at one straddle than any animal of his breed you ever see. Jumping on a dead level was his strong suit, you understand, and when it come to that, Smiley would ante up money on him as long as he had a red. Smiley was monstrous proud of his frog, and well he might be, for fellows that had travelled and been everywheres all said he laid over any frog that ever they see. Well, Smiley kept the beast in a little lattice box, and he used to fetch him down town sometimes and lay for a bet. One day a fellow, a stranger in the camp he was, come across him with his box and says, What might it be that you've got in the box? And Smiley says, sort of indifferent, like, it might be a parrot, or it might be a canary, maybe, but it ain't, it's only just a frog. And the fella took it and looked at it careful, and turned it round this way and that, and says, Hmm, so tis. Well, what's he good for? Well, Smiley says, easy and careless, he's good enough for one thing. I should judge he can out-jump any frog in Calaveras County. The fellow took the box again, and took another long particular look, and give it back to Smiley, and says, very deliberate, Well, I don't see no points about that frog that's any better than any other frog. Maybe you don't, Smiley says. Maybe you understand frog and maybe you don't understand them. Maybe you've had experience, and maybe you are only an amateur, as it were. Anyways, I've got my opinion, and I'll risk forty dollars that he can out-jump any frog in Calaveras County. And the fellow studied a minute, and then says, kind of sad-like, well, I'm only a stranger here, and I ain't got no frog. But if I had a frog, I'd pet you. And then Smiley says, That's all right, that's all right. If you'll hold my box a minute, I'll go and get you a frog. And so the fella took the box and put up his forty dollars along with Smiley's and sat down to wait. So he sat there a good while, thinking and thinking to himself, and then he got the frog out and prized his mouth open, and took a teaspoon and filled him full of quail shot, filled him pretty near up to his chin, and set him on the floor. Smiley he went to the swamp and slopped around in the mud for a long time, and finally he catched a frog and fetched him in, and give him to this fellow, and says... Now, if you're ready, set him alongside of Daniel, with his four paws just even with Daniel, and I'll give the word. Then he says, one, two, three, jump! And him and the fella touched up the frogs from behind. And the new frog hopped off, but Daniel give a heave, and hoisted up his shoulders so, like a Frenchman but it wasn't no use. He couldn't budge. He was planted as solid as an anvil, and he couldn't no more stir than if he was anchored out. 
Smiley was a good deal surprised, and he was disgusted too, but he didn't have no idea what the matter was, of course. The feller took the money and started away, and when he was going out at the door, he sort of jerked his thumb over his shoulders, this way, at Dan'l, and says again, very deliberate, "'Well, I don't see no points about that frog that's any better than any other frog.' Smiley, he stood scratching his head and looking down at Dan'l a long time, and at last he says, I do wonder what in the nation that frog throwed off for. I wonder if there ain't something the matter with him. He appears to look mighty baggy somehow. And he catched Dan'l by the nap of the neck and lifted him up and says, Why, well, blame my cats if he don't weigh five pound. And turned him upside down, and he belched out a double handful of shot. And then he see how it was. And he was the maddest man. He set the frog down and took out after that feller, but he never catched him. And here... Simon Wheeler heard his name called from the front yard, and got up to see what was wanted. And, turning to me as he moved away, he said, "'Just set where you are, stranger, and rest easy. I ain't going to be gone a second. But, by your leave, I did not think that a continuation of the history of the enterprising vagabond Jim Smiley would be likely to afford me much information concerning the Reverend Leonidas W. Smiley and so I started away. At the door I met the sociable Wheeler returning, and he buttonholed me and recommenced. Well, this here Smiley had a yellow one-eyed cow that didn't have no tail, only just a short stump like a banana, and, oh, hang Smiley and his afflicted cow, I muttered good-naturedly and bidding the old gentleman good day, I departed. Now let the learned look upon this picture, and say if iconoclasm can further go. End of the Notorious Jumping Frog of Calaveras County Recording by Ruth Goldie